I am Shua. And you are listening to Light Up with Shua, a weekly podcast to open our hearts and minds on a journey with me. Hi, Asif. Hello, Shua. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Doing great. Thank you for taking our time. I'm really uh, looking forward to our conversation today. No problem. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. So tell me who you are and what do you do briefly? Uh, sure. Um, my name is Asif Masood. As you said, I was born and raised here in Chicago, Illinois. I am the oldest son of immigrants uh, from India. They uh, they immigrated here uh, from Hyderabad, India. My dad actually came here in 1959. He came here as a student, um, and he spent some time here at various universities. And then he went back to India and got married to my mom in 1968. And then my mom arrived here in early 69, and, um, and I was born here in uh, late, uh, mid-late uh, 1969. Mm. Um, so... I am a child of immigrants, and I grew up here in the Chicago area. And I'm not sure how much detail you want. Yeah, but that's good. That's, so you have been always so, uh, uh, in Chicago area. Have you I traveled around? Have been. I, I, I have traveled all over the place, but I've lived, uh, lived. in Chicago. Uh, I went to school actually here in mm -hmm. IIT. I got my electrical engineering degree, oh. although I, I didn't work a day in my life <laughs> in electrical engineering pretty soon. There, I got a job in IT, in uh, information technology, and I've been working um, at the Sears Holdings Corporation for the last 26 years in information technology. Mm. Um, and about five years ago, um, I got into learning more about myself. I got into social-emotional intelligence mm -hmm. um, uh, courses at the Wright Foundation for the mm -hmm. Realization of Human Potential. And two years ago, I uh, the foundation itself has a fully accredited graduate university. So I started my master's, um, my master's degree about two years ago in uh, transformational leadership and coaching. Mm -hmm. And I just finished that degree uh, two months ago. Wonderful, uh, wonderful. Wow, what a transition from IT and engineering and, you know, going in this direction. That's it very is, good. And it's not a hard transition. Uh -huh. uh, definitely engineering to IT was. I still have my job in uh -huh. IT. Uh -huh. So it's more the social emotional intelligence. I mean, uh -huh. it changes your life anywhere. Yeah. Like my degree is a leadership degree. So I'm applying all that I've learned okay. at my IT field. Right. But also, you know, I'm a student leader at the Wright Foundation. So I take classes still even. Uh -huh. But then I'm also a leader. And so I facilitate and coach and you know, do other things for wonderful, the foundation. Wonderful. Uh, my question, going back to your parents' uh, uh, immigration, was it smooth for them to come at in those days? I assume. I, in some ways, I think it was. I don't know that yes, compared they to now. what they were expecting. Yeah. Um, well, now you know, with, with Trump, you've got all <laughs> kinds of challenges. Right? But yeah. they had their own. You know, I started yeah. looking into you know just I, even my mom. You yeah. know, because um, I know um, like. You know, we all have fears, right? But I know that I get a lot of my fear from my mom. Mm -hmm. So I started looking into, you know, how how is it for her to come to America, right? Mm -hmm. And you just think about it, you know, in the 1960s, it was an arranged marriage, right? So she really didn't know her husband, right? So that's number one. Mm -hmm. how, how terrifying is that going to be? And then she arrived in a new country, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, you know, we knew about America and the British and stuff, right? I mean, she, you know, it was a British colony, right, mm -hmm. before India. So she knew English. And they kind of knew what, the think, what they think what the culture was, but I'm sure it was a culture shock mm -hmm. when she arrived here. So it's a brand new country, so that's number two, mm -hmm. right? And then the third thing is she had a baby within a year. Oh, wow. um, you know, her and parents you, weren't here. That was she you. That was me. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So she didn't really have any support here. Her parents were back there. Her siblings mm -hmm. were back there. So all three things, I would imagine it would have been a terrifying experience that's for her. That's good that you're thinking right? about that. That's <laughs> yeah. nice. To, you're trying to empathize with her. Are your parents yeah, alive? Exactly. They are alive. Okay, yeah. good, good. Yeah. Very nice. Okay, good. So let's come to uh, how good a father are you? So how do you rate yourself? <laughs> I would rate myself as probably a six or seven. Uh, okay. This is an you know this is an ongoing process, right? Yes. It's an ongoing relationship, mm -hmm. and um, you know it's been a, it's been an interesting journey for me because mm -hmm. we got divorced when she was five or six, so that mm -hmm. was. That was a challenge for me 
to have my daughter with me every day and then to only see her, you know, every other weekend or, you know, during the week, maybe for dinner. So that was definitely a challenge. Mm. And, um, you know, and as any teenagers go, as she becoming, as she became, you know, a preteen and all that, I mean, it's, it's interesting, you know, having conversations with her. Mm -hmm. Um, at the time I would ask her, how are you doing? And, you know, it'd be these one word answers, right? Fine. And, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I would push a little bit to try to get some more and she would start crying, you know, and this was a way for her to kind of, um, you know, stop from going deeper. But as I started this work about five years ago, um, uh, one of my coaches told me, you know, this is something that women do when they want you to back off, they'll start crying. You know, first I thought this is a very <laughs> sexist. So. <laughs> well, this is a very sexist statement. That's what I thought. Right. It, it, initially. But then this is a woman telling me this, um, well, you know, so I'm like, OK, it depends might be, on her experience. Yeah. It, it, yeah. it does. Yeah. And it was something to try, you know, yeah. I mean, because okay. we don't know how That's people right. are going to react. So mm-hmm. so I took her advice. And, you know, the next time I was interacting with my daughter and she started crying, I, I'm like, OK, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not. I want to have this conversation. I want to know what's going on mm-hmm. with you. Mm-hmm. And then she started crying some more. I'm like, I'm not leaving. I, <laughs> I want to connect with you. Uh-huh. And then she really mm-hmm. she started bawling. And but mm-hmm. then she let it out. Mm-hmm. You know, she talked about. You know, the divorce and some of the ah, okay. challenges you face from that. And mm. that, that was the start of me developing a real, authentic, direct connection with her. And ah. it's grown every did you Did you yeah. do this degree in uh, for any reason because of, you know, trying to connect with your daughter? Was there any in- yeah. incentive? Yeah, uh, I think the biggest thing was uh, after I got divorced, really, my daughter was the focus of my life and she was the focus of my life for a very long time and she was about to finish high school you know and at that point I was just wondering all right what is my focus going to be like now that she's going to leave and she's going to go off to college and whatnot and so this is when a friend of mine was telling me about this um, introductory program that the Wright Foundation has and I was a little resistant I, I didn't know much about it and you know they talk about emotions and how to really deeply feel our emotions and you know it was kind of like I'm a guy why do I need to feel but you know it's, it was kind of the whole stuff you know guys don't feel emotions right all that all the negative thing thinking or all the cultural stuff that we have around emotions and yeah. but finally I'm like all right you know maybe I'll find a purpose here maybe I'll find something and I did the introductory weekend and I really was blown away um, in a multiple levels you know part of it was you know I really found how lonely I was because I really hadn't been in a relationship in a long time and so that was one aspect of it but then it, we talk a lot about purpose. We talk a lot about, you know, really harnessing and feeling our emotions, right? So emotional intelligence, you know, self-awareness mm-hmm. and really, um, you know, first recognizing our emotions and then being able to express our emotions. And then as we um, recognize our own emotions, that creates a level of empathy with others because now we get to understand others' emotions because we can understand our own. So it's all, you know, um, been around emotional and then social intelligence as mm. we get better at it. Excellent. So it seems like that is a good um, knowledge for adults and parents to have so they can realize many things they might be missing with their children. Absolutely. I mean, you know, this is something, um, you know, parenting. This is. I was joking around with, uh, who was it, my uncle uh, this past weekend. We were talking about parenting and mm-hmm. how, you know, you don't need a license to parent, you know. Mm. You, you know, you need a license to fish. You need a license to drive. Yes. But to be a parent, you don't need a license. You don't need any qualifications. Exactly. And a lot of us are not qualified. And, exactly. and the other thing we learn here in the program is parents aren't perfect. You know, we're human beings and mm-hmm. we do the best that we can. And so it's our job then as adults to finish uh, you know, the things that we don't necessarily like how we were parented, right? You know, because our parents aren't perfect. And we came up with techniques to kind of um, manage our lives as we were children. But those techniques, they might not, uh, they've served us well as children. They don't necessarily serve us as adults. So it's our job now to figure out who we want to be as adults and then, you know, transform into the folks that we can and want to become. Mm. So this can and want and who we should be, how do you come to that? How, because cultures also contribute in it a lot, right? They do. Uh, Culture is a big part of it. We talk about, you know, who we, culture, some of it is genetic, but a lot of it is culture. A lot of it is family. A lot of it is our primary caregiver. So all of that stuff 
makes us who we are, right? Um, and so this is uh, conformity, right? This is a big part of conformity. We conform to our surroundings. Mm. as and, and, and different people have it at different times. But usually, especially in Western culture, there's a form of rebellion that happens, right? At that age, who when they move away from, uh, from who they were and the cultural norms that the parents and, you know, that, that immediate culture uh, created for them and they find out who they want to become. That can happen at any time. I think it, for me, actually, it happened much later in life mm -hmm. because I was the oldest child. I was also, you know, for me, I was the Boy Scout. You know, I was the goody two-shoe. I was the good boy. Listen to my parents. I didn't really have that same level of rebellion. I had some small ones, but not the big one. I think that happened for me much later in life. Um, and so this is something existentialists talk about, around mm. conformity and, um, you know, moving away from that as we learn to become that we're mortal. You know, we become, uh, we realize that, and then part of that is becoming um, authenticity and responsibility. Uh, authenticity is something we move away from our conformity, from who we were, and find out you know, authentically who we are and who we want to be. And it's, there's no formula. Everybody is different, but it's more about being on the journey to figure out who we want to become. Mm. And, uh, and there's so many things I could say about that, but let me stop here. Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now it is interesting, and I think that's very helpful to realize that who we are and, you know, you have to shape your life accordingly. Finding yourself yeah. and all, yeah. and, and it's an ongoing process because it's like it you know we stop. have this yeah. goal and we reach it. Yep. You don't stop yep. here. Life mm -hmm. doesn't stop. It's yep. the next goal, yep. then so, the next goal, the next one. Yeah. So I was so, going to ask you about parenting, which you already said that not everybody is fit or or uh, attuned to be a good parent. I mean, what is the definition of parenting? You know, like there is no one definition. I mean, there is no one definition, and I think it's just I don't know that anybody. I mean, we're all try to be the best that we can, right? But the failing is, I think we're all, I don't want to say we're all good parents, but we, uh, most parents want what's best for their children, right? They might not know how to do that. They yeah. might not know. Um, a lot of times I think uh, this, and this is part of me, mm -hmm. is we want, um, what I wanted is different than what my parents wanted. You know, they wanted the best for me, but that's not necessarily what I wanted, you yeah. know? So, so there's sometimes there's a disconnect. But yeah. what we learn about is, the best parents spend 30% of their time with their children, right? 30%. Mm. That's the best parents. And none of us, I don't know that we can consider ourselves the best parents. Mm. So it's like there's just, um, there's going to be work for a child to do no matter what mm. happens. It's, it's something, you know, because no one's perfect. Mm. So it's there's unfinished business that's going to happen. And so what the Right Foundation does is, you know, they have parenting programs. They start from a very young age where they watch the interactions between the children and the parents. And then you actually get feedback from other children, mm. you know. Oh, you're coddling that your child too much, or you should expect more from your children, or, you know, just mm. the, you get feedback from these 10-year-old kids that have gone through the program, and, and, and they can see how you're being with your children. Mm. And then you'll get some adult, you know, uh, feedback as well. But, mm -hmm. you know, it really hits home when a 10-year-old child is giving you feedback about mm -hmm. how you're parenting. Right? Yeah. So. yeah. So I think also, uh, I mean, yeah, in Western countries or Western world, we do start quantifying everything and um, or putting numbers on it. Personally, I, it's good to have that, but I personally, I'm not too fond of like putting the percentages of how sure. much a parent should be doing spending time or minimum or maximum this and because it all there's so many variables in that and right. who you are like i if i i was i am being a mother versus being a father uh as a whole how much time can you spend and all that and that is very different for every family because depending on their work schedules which country they are um, their cultural backgrounds, this and the other. So I tried my best to be with my children, and I would I'm in much higher slot in the, than that, and personally that I know. And uh, uh, and it's also the quality of time, right? So exactly. quantity is not always not the always, best thing. Yeah. We're yeah. just sitting there watching TV for five hours. That's not the best use of your time. You're just or sitting you next to your children. Yeah, right. exactly, right. exactly. So yeah, um, what uh, what do you think about 
how can we teach our children in your experience? And it seems like you have, uh, you know, from the degree point of view, from your experience and this emotional intelligence that you have been interacting with, uh, how can we teach our children to be confident um, or... And sp then I can come a little bit on a few minutes we can spend on bullying. That's where the yeah. topic was. Uh, what's what are some couple of things that you can mention? And I will go yeah. faster after this. That so yeah. I know you're short of time. I, I think it's actually very related. Um, you know, I think it's being open with our children. I, I mean, there, there's a fine line, right? I mean, you have to set boundaries for your children, mm -hmm. but um, but it's also about the discipline mm -hmm. and how. You discipline and how you interact with your mm -hmm. children because mm -hmm. I think the where it becomes um, where it becomes a challenge or where it becomes a problem mm -hmm. is when we break our children mm -hmm. um, uh, and this is what a lot of parents do where they want the kids to conform or they want the kids to listen to them mm -hmm. um, necessarily see their children and so this is this, the heavy hand that parents have in a way to break, they, they end up breaking their children. That might not be the intent, mm. but they get to listen to them. And yeah. this carries on actually into the bullying. This carries on because um, and we've seen this with the research that, uh, not necessarily with bullying, but we've seen it with spouses. You know, if you have a parent that the child is always saying yes to or always subservient or submissive to the parent, mm -hmm. find a partner that's just like that, mm. you know, because that's what they know. That's what's normal for them mm. in a lot of I can't say 100 percent, but this is a lot of the time, they, you know, these children, this is was this was very important for me to make sure um, uh, how the interaction was with my daughter, especially with, you know, my ex-wife and my uh, my daughter, because my ex, um, you know, would use religion, especially, you know, this is what the uh, this is what the Quran says to, to not be disobedient to your parents as a way to tell her to shut up, you know, mm. so it's, what people do, they use different things um, to control their children, right? Mm. So I think it's very important to have dialogue with their children mm. and to really, um, and there's times, you know, we're going to be short. I mean, um, you know, that that's just natural because like you said, we all have stresses in our lives and things like that. Uh, but what's critical is the repair that happens with our children. Because when we are short with them or we send them to their rooms or you have an you have a conflict with your children. The conflict isn't what's important. It's the repair that happens afterwards because you want to rebuild them back up, mm. right? Um, and so th this is it's very important that when you, you do tear, tear your child down, that to you repair that and build them back up. Mm -hmm. that, 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 is, that skill should be learned or it doesn't come naturally, do you think? I don't think so. I think it's... And it's also dependent on how we were parented, yep, you know. Yep, so of course. So all but, yeah. but as if I, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Like we don't pay attention to ourselves, right? That's where you started with, like knowing yourself, paying attention to yourself. Because if you know that, okay, this was missing in my lifetime, and you felt that, then you will try to not uh, repeat it with your children. You will, and sometimes we do the opposite where yeah, we're too we, nice, and also has a detriment because yeah. when you're too nice, you know, you create these princesses yes. in the world that yeah. expect everything, and that's not how the world is either. Not so only princesses, princesses. Uh, princess. princess. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not true. I have a daughter. So I, I know, I know. I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> but so it's a balance, and you're yeah. right. I think the key is self-awareness. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, you know, what, what we talk about is you can and impact the world. You can't help others until you really do your own internal work. Yeah, yeah. And as you're doing your internal work, that's not that you wait either, that you have to do your work before you can help mm -hmm. others, but it's an ongoing thing. But what's critical is mm -hmm. doing your own internal work. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the way mm -hmm. that you start helping others yeah. around. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so what do you think, uh, what, what are the things that money can't buy in our life? Money can't buy. Yeah, uh, just a couple of things, one thing, three things, well, like, quickly, what can you tell me? Well, so, you know, uh, for me, I think it's um, money can't buy you satisfaction. Okay. I have known many people, um, the, the, I mean, I think the ultimate satisfaction thing. Satisfaction of what? Just in your life. Mm. You know, there's a level, we talk about wants 
on one hand and we talk about yearnings on the other. Mm -hmm. And, you know, wants are superficial things, buying a brand new car, you know, having a new girlfriend, mm -hmm. traveling, mm -hmm. you know, all these superficial things. Mm -hmm. We feel like it's going to make us happy, buying a brand new car, you know, mm -hmm. whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And you get that item. And all of a sudden, you might feel happy in the moment mm -hmm. for a few seconds, minutes, whatever, and then it goes away. And then you want that next new toy, mm -hmm. you know? And, mm -hmm. um, and it just, it's, uh, and then there's it's never science. ending. <laughs> so, what we orient to here is looking at our yearnings, mm -hmm. you know? And, you know, this is say yearnings are things like that are uh, deeply inside that will. Uh, when we follow our yearnings, they will deeply satisfy us. And so examples of that is, you know, one, making, uh, making a difference in the world, mm -hmm. mattering, connecting with someone, you know, to love and be loved, um, to, to orient to a higher power. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, a, there's a lot of different uh, yearnings, mm -hmm. and, and we actually have multiple yearnings, but it's mm -hmm. orienting to our yearnings. Mm -hmm. And money can't buy you those things. I've known a lot of people with money that have come to these programs because they've had all this money, they've had success, mm -hmm. you know, all of this stuff, and they still feel like a deep, empty hole inside mm -hmm. because their yearnings are not satisfied. Mm -hmm. the, the material things have not so given how do you, them... So how do you satisfy? How do you get a fulfilled life? Then? For me right now is the two core yearnings that I'm following is to matter and make a difference. That's mm -hmm. actually what led me to the bullying presentation. Mm -hmm. That's led me to the interfaith stuff that I'm doing now because mm -hmm. um, I really feel like I want to make a difference in the world and those are the... the I will come to I'm the following. interfaith uh, also briefly. Sure. Um, why don't you talk about it now? Tell me what's the value of interfaith in your life and in your experience. I, you know, I think it's about... This is back to empathy this is back to you know walking in someone else's shoes mm -hmm. you don't know until you've met another you know i'm muslim so you don't know until mm -hmm. you've met a christian or a mm -hmm. jew mm -hmm. or a buddhist or a hindu mm -hmm. um, or you know whatever even an atheist like mm -hmm. it's about getting to know them and then it's also about them getting to know me to mm -hmm. kind of figure out uh, how you know what makes me tick you know until we start doing that until we start having that dialogue and empathy i don't think you know, the, the world is not going to change. I mean, this age of Trump right now, mm -hmm. a lot of it, people don't know. I mean, they don't know Muslims. They don't know mm -hmm. Hispanic. You yep. have all this rhetoric of the other. Mm -hmm. It's changing the conversation from the other to we. We are all in this together, and it's, it's a conversation of we. Yeah. Even, and this is tough for me to say, but it's something that my professor said, you know, even with Trump and his people, and the election, it's not that they elected Trump. Mm -hmm. We elected Trump. You know, yeah. we are also partly responsible for this. So it's looking at all of it as mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. instead of the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point and a good lesson because once we are in it together, we need to resolve it together too. And right. you know, the understanding that's good. Um, do you think uh, uh, Muslims generally, in your experience? are a little, sh you know, shy in interacting with other communities, um, uh, other I, I, ethnicities or they faiths? Are, they are, and I think there's different reasons for that. Mm -hmm. um, and we could probably spend a long time just even a, talking about it. Just a minute about, uh, about it. Any, any something conspicuous that you can point it out so maybe our listeners... I've can. heard there's multiple factors. Part of it is some Muslims are not strong in their own faith. Mm. So they have this feeling like if they start interacting with people of other faith, they'll lose their own faith. Mm -hmm. So yep. I think that's a big part of it yep. where I've seen Muslims that don't interact. Mm -hmm. And I think some people are naturally, you know, they're naturally um, um, shy. Mm. You know, so I think that, that's that a, a part of that as well. And then mm -hmm. they are, they're also not sure how people are going to react. Mm -hmm. You know, so that also... You know, I think the, the baseline is they're going to get attacked mm -hmm. and they so, don't have... So let's come to this. How do we yes. get all this, these weaknesses that we have as a community or as an individual or whatever? Or, and can, it can be in any, any community, not only Muslim community. But what is the... Is there a solution to it? Any quick solutions do you have? I th any suggestions? You know, you get involved. I, I, part of Basically, it is stretching. Yeah. Part of it is... You know, doing something challenging that you're not comfortable with, because mm -hmm. a lot of people are just not comfortable in try and challenging themselves, and that's another thing that I've learned. You know, it's like living in the comfort zone, actually, or outside of the comfort zone. And you know, one of the, my professors said, you know, if you don't have this anxiety, if you're not feeling scared, then you're not stretching, you're not doing something, you're not growing. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, we always want to be growing. And mm-hmm. part of, you know, growing is that you're going to feel uncomfortable. Yeah. And it's actually being That's okay. a good point. Um, being uncomfortable. Thank you. That's a very, like, yeah, you have to go into an in uncomfortable zone in order for you to, you know, uh, feel and realize and what, how you can change it. That's true. Right. Thank you for that. Um, so, what do you like about yourself being uh, all what you do and what you have learned? <laughs> um, I think it's just uh, the man I'm becoming, you know, the, the man that's facing fears, mm-hmm. the man that's actually creating relationships in mm-hmm. a way that I hadn't before, you know, especially after I got divorced. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I, was, I very much isolated myself. You know, mm-hmm. I did stuff with my daughter when she was with me, um, but when she wasn't, you know, I was pretty much into playing video games and mm-hmm. kind of just being on my own. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's really shifted. Mm-hmm. But I this work past five years, you know, um, I have many engagements with people in a way that I haven't before. Like, and that I'm becoming, and this is not the end. I'm yeah, continuing to challenge myself. So you are, you know, um, you know acknowledging that it's a continuous growth. Yep. It is. Excellent. Yeah. And what do you want to, something that you want to change in yourself or your life? Um, I think it's being, you know, so you don't know me who I was five years ago and you know me kind of the, the, um, the, what I'm giving you, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, and so the core work that I'm working on now mm-hmm. is to really let people into me, you know, letting my walls down, mm. being vulnerable with people yeah. and sharing things and, mm. you know, and then letting them in. That's the, that's, so I've done, you know, the signature year long program that the foundation offers. Then I did the two year emotional intelligence program. Mm-hmm. And now I'm in the two year social intelligence program. I'm about a year into that. Mm-hmm. And so part of my core work is to let my walls down and That's let nice. people in. You know, yeah. so. Which is very hard for generally, I'm being biased for men to do it. <laughs> what is the value of gratitude? I think the value of gratitude is just to appreciate the people in your life. It's, it's to, because a lot of, you know, and I'll speak for myself, like I haven't always seen all the people in my life and all the care, all the love, Mm. all of the beauty that's around me, Mm -hmm. you know, and this is something that actually just someone pointed out just, you know, especially with, with my walls up and I'm not letting people in, but people haven't given up on me. Hmm. You know, they still want to be with me. They still want to have a relationship with me, and they they still come back and to be a and just like really wow. You know, I haven't really been all that nice to you, and you still have hmm. stuck it out with me. That's, that's I am right. so grateful for that. You know, and so things like that. Hmm, that's just to good. Appreciate all that you have around you, but don't you don't always see it. Uh, so, what is the value of time? I'm. Um, I, I think, I mean, there are so many things to get done and we waste a lot of time mm. uh, and myself included. I'm better at it. Uh, there's actually a training that we do at the foundation called soft addiction training. Mm. And we really look at how much time we waste. Mm. So even just things like procrastination, things like we call soft addiction, you know, not hard addictions. I mean, although hard addictions are also bad, but soft addictions like you know, it's okay to be on Facebook. It's not okay to be on Facebook for two hours. Mm. You know, I mean, so it's just like looking at where do we waste time and how can we better use, utilize our time. Coming so back time to is self-evaluation and accountability. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. That's good. Um, what is this life? An illusion in your viewpoint or what is it? Gosh. Okay. So now you're going very <laughs> yes. spiritual. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. I last last this part is, of our interview. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't think it's an illusion. I mean, although that's been thrown out, I think mm-hmm. uh, life is giving to given to us, and our life is unique. Mm-hmm. This is something um, one of the uh, founders of the Wright Foundation, Judith Wright, she talks about. You know, what what is transformation? What is what's purpose? You know, mm-hmm. why are we here? And one of the things she talks about is we have a unique gift. Mm-hmm. There is no one like us. There is no one that can make a difference like us, you know. And so it's really unfortunate if we don't use our time wisely, if we don't utilize our gift of life to really have an impact, um, you know, on those around us. And mm. to have an impact, it starts with ourselves. That you know? was my next question. What is the purpose of your life? I think the purpose of my life mm-hmm. is to be the best I can be. 
Uh, um, you know, it's not best about, in like uh, what? In, you know, this is you know when I talked about you get to this one place. It's not about stopping here. It's about doing that. So being my next best self, continuously mm. being my next next best self, mm. but with with having in the back of my mind that I'm doing this not in a self-serving way, mm. but as a way to impact the world, to have an influence in the world, and to make the world a better place. I mean, that's ultimately my purpose. I mean, as Muslims, we talk about getting into heaven and, mm. you know, those, you know, Jannah and all those kinds of things, you know, and so that's still there, but not everybody believes that, right? So, and so my purpose, of course, yes. Do I want to go into heaven? Yes, I want to go into heaven, but to me, the tangible thing for more about this life is, you know, making the world a better place. Mm -hmm. um, make, make the heaven here. Start, start yeah, practicing start here. here, I guess. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, what would you do differently today if you knew there, that there was no tomorrow? <laughs> yes. You know, I mean, if there was no tomorrow, I would imagine that I would use every second that I had more wisely, right? So as much work as I've done, there are still times where I don't, I mean, I might do something that's not, you know, ultimately um, productive, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we all have our little things that we do. So I wasn't, if there was no tomorrow, then I would make sure that every second that I had today um, was fruitful. Okay. okay. Um, any message of hope that would you like, you would like Absolutely. to give? Absolutely. I think, you know, the mind is wondrous. Uh, people are wondrous. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot that, of hate and things that are in this world, but I think if I didn't believe that we could change, if I didn't believe we could change each other, I would not be doing this. So I, I think it, it's all about hope. Uh, we are wondrous. We can change our minds, you know, and we can change uh, other people's minds and people can change their own minds. But it's just, it's, it's, it's cool. I mean, we're not set in our ways that any of us can change and that that's the beauty of our brain and that's the beauty of life. Mm. Thank you. So my last question is, what lights you up? <laughs> what lights me up? Mm. I think, you know, there, there's a certain level of satisfaction that happens. Um, and I'll just tell you like the bullying presentation, you know, it took a lot of effort. It took a lot of uh, time and, you know, it wasn't always pretty. Um, I mean, there was, um, you know, there was, there's a lot, our own bullying experience. I mean, all that stuff came up, you know, um, and at the end of the day, when I'm sitting there, we did our presentation and you saw the audience and the impact that we had and people came up and asked questions. And, you know, this is like, I made a difference today. And that experience, that level of satisfaction of meeting my yearnings, that lit me up. And that's why I continue to do this. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Asif. Thank you for staying with me through this exciting episode. Please don't forget to subscribe and stay tuned for the next episode of Light Up with Shwa.